All right, let's have a lot of fun learning about medical ethics on the USMLE, and hopefully we'll cover everything you need to know. We'll cover topics such as pregnant minors, spousal abuse, child abuse, abortion, and more. You could find a review sheet of everything we're going to talk about at my website, ajmonix.com. All right, so let's begin. Let's begin with prenatal care for a minor. Here we have a 16-year-old female who misses her period, and she's pregnant. Her pregnancy test is positive. She seeks prenatal care with you, and she demands that you keep it confidential from her parents. Here we have a picture of her saying, don't tell my parents, or maybe more like, don't tell my parents. So what do you do? Do you keep it confidential from her parents? And the answer is, absolutely. Provide care and keep it confidential. Although parental notification is usually required, prenatal care is an exception. You do not have to inform either the parents or the father of the baby. This applies even if the parents were to ask. So again, keep the prenatal care confidential. And I put a note over here that this confidentiality for minors applies similarly to areas of oral contraceptives, STDs, and rehabilitation or detox for substance abuse, that you don't need to notify the parents. All right, spousal abuse. We have a female patient who tells you that her husband physically abuses her. Do you need to report this? The answer is no, not without her consent. Do not report the abuse without her consent. Ask the patient if she feels safe and help create an emergency plan, but don't report it without her consent. And I wrote a note over here that the rules for domestic or spousal abuse are much less strict than those on reporting child abuse. Child abuse is more severe. And that's because an adult has voluntary choice of reporting his or her own injury. Also, we have to respect the patient's autonomy. Now let's move on to child abuse. So a child with several unexplained burn wounds explains to the pediatrician, I get hurt when I am bad. So it seems as though he's getting abused. Do you need to report this? Absolutely. Report the family to Child Protective Services. Reporting child abuse is mandatory even based on suspicion alone. So even if you just suspect it, you need to report it. And I wrote a note over here that the reporting of elder abuse is similar to that of child abuse. Now, although the legal requirements differ from state to state, the ethical requirement of the physician is the same is that it should be reported. Brain death. We have a patient who is determined to be brain dead. The family wants continued life support. They say, you see, he still moves when he's touched. So what do you do? Do you pull the plug or not? And the answer is brain death equals death. Brain death in medicine is the same as death. So you explain to the family kindly that brain death equals death and there's no chance of recovery. The movement is simply due to involuntary spinal reflexes. So bring the case to the appropriate ethics board, but the result will be that brain death equals death. And I wrote a note over here that although the physician has a legal right to turn off the ventilator immediately on a person who is brain dead, the physician should speak to the family first. That's the most appropriate thing to do. Okay, refusing treatment on religious grounds. Let's take a look at the case. We have a mother and her 14-year-old daughter who are unresponsive following a car accident and require a blood transfusion. The father says, Do not transfuse them. It is against our religion. So the father is saying, based on religious grounds, that they should not be transfused. So do we transfuse the mother and her daughter? And the answer is, transfuse the daughter, but not the mother. Emergency care cannot be refused for religious reasons for a minor, even by a parent or proxy. So we give the transfusion to the daughter, but not the mother. Vaccination refusal. A child's parent refuses standard vaccination. What should you do? You see a picture over here. I refuse vaccination for my child. Response, do not administer vaccines without a parent's consent. You should explain the risks, however, and benefits of vaccinations and why they are recommended. Teenage pregnancy. A 15-year-old pregnant girl wants to raise her future child. The mother says, No, give it up for adoption. So daughter wants baby, mom wants adoption. What do we do? The girl can make her own decisions regarding her child. This is just like prenatal care. We trust the minor. Even if her mother or father disagrees, but I wrote a parentheses over here, but still provide information and options for termination and encourage family discussion. Abortion. A 17-year-old is pregnant and wants an abortion. Can she have the abortion? So many states require parental consent, that should say consent, for minors for an abortion. Some require just notification. Some require one parent and some require both. It's quite a complicated topic. And therefore I wrote in red letters over here, not testable, that the USMLE will not test us on this material. And that's because states differ on the matter. And since states differ, the USMLE will not ask about it. That being said, I wrote, a physician should not sway the patient's decision for or against an abortion unless there is a medical risk involved. Discuss the options of terminating pregnancy with the patient. All right, next, the extent of implied consent. So we have a patient who's brought to the emergency room unconscious and requires a blood transfusion. His shirt says that he's one of Jay's witnesses. And in general, someone from Jay's witnesses would not want a blood transfusion. So what do we do? 
The answer is give the blood, transfuse the patient. The t-shirt is not a clear advance directive, so there's no implied consent to save his life. Even if we were sure he was one of Jay's witnesses, you can't be certain he'd refuse the blood. The patient must specifically say that he doesn't want the blood in a specific situation. Otherwise, we do what's in his best interest, and that's to save his life through the blood transfusion. Assisted suicide. A terminally ill woman requests assisted dying from the physician. Do we end her life? The overwhelming majority of states prohibit most forms of physician-assisted suicide. This applies even if the patient is competent and the family are willing to honor the patient's wishes. However, this is an important point, however, all agree that physicians may prescribe medically appropriate analgesics even if they shorten the patient's lifespan. All right, next question. Removing the feeding tube. A 73-year-old man with advanced COPD is on a ventilator and now a nasogastric tube is placed to deliver feeding. The patient is alert and asks that the tube be removed because of discomfort. Can we remove the tube? And this is not physician-assisted suicide, this is just removing therapy. And the answer is, take the tube out right away. An adult patient with the ability to understand his medical problems has the right to stop any form of therapy he wishes. This applies even against the wishes of the family or proxy. Suicidal patient refusing treatment. Let's take a look. A 65-year-old man attempts suicide and is now severely hemorrhaging. I guess he was unsuccessful. In the ER, he refuses consent for surgery to stop the bleeding, stating that he wants to die. So he wants to die. What should we do? Perform the surgery. Don't listen to the patient. An adult patient with the capacity to understand can refuse treatment, but not a patient who is considered incompetent. For example, one attempting to commit suicide. Physician error when physicians make mistakes. You accidentally perform an invasive test on the wrong patient. What do you do? A physician is obligated to inform the patient that a mistake was made, regardless of the outcome. In the note over here, that medical errors are one of the most difficult and embarrassing issues in the ethical management of patients, but there is an absolutely clear obligation to inform the patient of the error. Even if the patient may sever the relationship and engage in litigation, you have to report the error. Medical records. A patient goes to the hospital to obtain a copy of her medical record for personal review. The hospital refuses to release them, saying that she must provide adequate reason for wishing to see the records. Here she is in the picture saying, Give me the records! She wants the records. Does the hospital have to provide them? Yes, the hospital is wrong. She has a right to her own records without giving a reason. It's the physician or the hospital who has to have a reason to obtain patient information, not the other way around. Confidentiality. Family members ask for information regarding a patient's condition or diagnosis. What do you do? No way, Jose. A physician should not discuss issues with relatives without the patient's consent. Refusing C-section. A 20-year-old woman in her last trimester is told that without a C-section, her fetus may not survive. She refuses the C-section because she doesn't want to undergo the discomfort of surgery. So if she doesn't have the C-section, baby might die. Here she is in the picture saying, No C-section! Honor the woman. Do not perform the C-section. The fetus is part of her body, and she can decide what she wants to do with her body. This applies even if her husband is present and demand that a C-section be performed. Withholding results. A patient's brother asks you not tell the patient regarding poor test results, since the patient won't be able to handle it. So here we have the brother saying, Do not tell my brother the results. He won't handle it. So do you tell the brother or not? So the response is, try to figure out why the brother feels this way. Perhaps it is a cultural reason. But if the patient, that is the brother, wants the information, he is entitled to it. And the one exception is, if the information will lead to the patient seriously harming himself or someone else if informed, then you should not give the information. Physician impairment. For example, a physician that's drunk. You notice your colleague physician responding to routine medical calls while intoxicated. Do you have to report it? Absolutely. You are obligated, ethically and usually legally, to report the impaired colleague. Not college, colleague. Colleague. I'll have to change that. Seek guidance in reporting since procedures vary by institution and state. Physician misbehavior. So they're not getting drunk, they're misbehaving. Let's take a look. At a bar one night, you see a medical resident clearly drunk. You see her with a man that is clearly not her husband. The following day, you see her at the hospital managing patients. Do you have to report it? No, do nothing. Your responsibility for reporting physician impairment is exclusively with behavior that may affect patient care. Next case, accepting gifts. Can you accept gifts from your patients or from companies? Let's take a look. A company offers you a sponsorship in exchange for advertising its new drug. Can you take the sponsorship? No way, Jose. Reject the offer. In general, reject gifts and sponsorships from companies to avoid conflicts of interest. Exceptions are made in certain cases, but we're not going to discuss those because they're so complicated. Note, although gifts cannot be accepted, it is entirely ethically acceptable to participate in educational activities sponsored by the pharmacy industry as well as meals. So you can attend a dinner, let's say, by a drug company. Accepting meals from patients. You have a patient who is an elderly woman who is very grateful for your care. She brings you a home-cooked meal and a cake. So here she is, bringing you this large, delicious cake. 
Can you take the cake? Yes, you can. Accept the gift. Small gifts from patients of limited value are ethically acceptable. You may accept even non-food items, for example, a plant. And refusal might be hurtful. It might hurt the relationship. Now, there's an exception, though, that if the patient is only giving it to tie it to a specific expectation, such as completion of a form, then you should not do it. But if they're just doing it out of gratitude, then it's fine. Refusing new patients. We have a busy physician and he uh, doesn't want to expand his hours, so he begins refusing new patients. Is that allowed or not? So he has a sign that says, not accepting new patients. And the response is, it is both legal and even ethical to turn down new patients. This is entirely different from a case in which a patient is already under the care of a physician. Dropping that patient would be unethical and illegal. Perhaps you could transfer to a different doctor, but just not accepting new patients is entirely fine. However, in general, turning down a patient for personal preferences or race alone is unethical in general. Organ donation. We have a man who arrives to the emergency room on a ventilator after an accident and is soon determined to be brain dead. An organ donor card is found in his wallet, indicating his desire to donate. The donor became contacts the family, but they refused to sign consent for the donation. Oh, whoops, I already gave it away over here. Although the card indicates the patient's wish to donate, it is not appropriate to take the organs against the direct wishes of the family. That is why we ask for family consent. An organ donation card is not fully binding. Suicide suspicion. Patient is suicidal. What do you do? Well, assess the seriousness. If the patient has a plan to commit suicide, suggest that the patient voluntarily remain in the hospital. And if necessary, you may have to involuntarily keep the patient in the hospital. Egg and sperm donation. A couple comes to see you after trying IVF and artificial insemination. After having child, they want to sell leftover sperm, eggs, and fertilized gametes and embryos. Is that fine or not? They can sell and donate unfertilized gametes for example, the sperm and the egg, and even fertilized gametes, but it is not currently legal to sell embryos. So interestingly, you're allowed to sell fertilized gametes. Against the physician's belief, a patient requests a non-emergent procedure that is against your religious or personal beliefs. What do you do? Provide the patient with accurate and unbiased information that will allow the patient to make an informed decision, and in a non-judgmental manner, explain that you don't perform the procedure, but you will gladly offer to refer the patient to another physician. Physician-patient relationships. A patient male states that the physician female is attractive and asks to go on a date. What does she do? Romantic relationships with patients are never appropriate even if they like each other. It may be necessary to switch care to another physician or at least use a chaperone. Complaining to a physician about another physician. A patient is angry and complains about treatment received from another physician. What does the physician respond? Suggest that the patient speak directly to that physician regarding the concerns. If the physician is part of your office staff, state that you will speak to that person yourself. Alternative medicine. A patient wants to try alternative or holistic medicine. What do you respond? In a supportive, non-judgmental way, discuss the underlying reasons with the patient. Advise the patient of known benefits and risks of treatment, including adverse effects and medication interactions. A woman who underwent a mastectomy says she now feels unattractive. What do you respond? Talk to her and find out why she feels that way, but do not give false reassurance. Don't say, Oh, don't worry, you look exactly, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Because she doesn't look exactly the same. Patient anger. Patient is angry about the long time spent in the waiting room. What should you say to the patient? Acknowledge the patient's anger. Thank the patient for waiting patiently and apologize for any inconvenience, but avoid explaining the reason for the delay. Non-adherence. Patient does not adhere to physician's instructions. Maybe he's saying, I don't want to take the medicine. Do not coerce the patient. Determine what the nature of the non-adherence is, maybe financial or other obstacles, and advise accordingly. Consider referring the patient to another physician. We have a few questions over here, which include information which we have not yet discussed. So hang in there. Let's take a look at our first question. You have an HIV positive patient who is also a physician. This physician is very concerned about confidentiality and you're the only one who knows that he's HIV positive. Who are you legally obligated to inform? No one without his direct consent. HIV positive patient poses no significant risk to patients. But if he has a spouse and he's not telling his spouse, you do have to inform that spouse because the spouse is at risk. A 13 year old boy is brought to the emergency department due to head trauma. After evaluation, you determine he will need suturing of the scalp. Which of the following is true? Wait for one parent to give consent. This is not an emergency. A parent or legal guardian must give consent for such surgery to minors. If this, however, were an emergency, such as an emergency surgery, you would have to perform that even if you cannot contact the parents. A patient with schizophrenia tells you he's planning to kill his father when the time is right. What should you do? Inform the parent's father and law enforcement of the threat. This is because safety overrides confidentiality. A patient with MS develops renal failure secondary to diabetes. The patient had elected to put a DNR in order. The patient's potassium level is markedly elevated. What is the appropriate management? Go ahead with the dialysis. Ignore the DNR. DNR is specifically for cardiopulmonary resuscitative efforts. A fourth year medical student is with a patient who is in a severe car accident and is now brain dead. The ventilator is to be removed and organ donation is considered. Who should ask consent for the organ donation? The organ donor network 
for several reasons, and one of them most practically is that their chance of successfully obtaining the consent is far beyond the excess of students or physicians who ask. A medical student volunteering in a hospital on your team walks into a crowded elevator with you and asks, did the patient in room 470 get their MRI yet? What should you respond? Let's wait until later to discuss all the patients. And you can take a look at the other notes over here. A man is undergoing emergency treatment for acute myocardial infarction. A woman who claims to be his wife arrives at the hospital and says, I'm so worried! Please tell me if my husband is okay. What is the appropriate action? Tell the woman that the patient is stable, but further details will have to wait until the patient can give permission. A 40-year-old non-communicative patient with severe developmental delays develops leukemia. Chemotherapy has huge risks, and there's only a small chance of survival. What should you do? Ask the guardian what's in the patient's best interest. All right, that's the end of our lecture. I hope you enjoyed. Remember, check out my website in order to get a review sheet. All right, take care.